Just a quick introduction. My name is Dro Reese. Uh, I've been in the club since 1985. Uh, had the pleasure uh, to work in the shop for many years, and I had the pleasure to work as an instructor for many years. Uh, I try to avoid the politics, but as part of Hooper, it's almost impossible. But I do the best I can to be um, outside of that. But um, for you guys that are not fluent in Portuguese, Saidera, uh, what that means is one more than I gotta go. They're so efficient at this that if you're in a bar drinking beer, they usually just keep drink, bringing out the beers. And at some point, you want to indicate that, you know, maybe the next one you should ask before you bring it up. And that's a common word used for that. So it's like, one more, then I really got to go, but repeat as necessary. So, <laughs> so that's the origin of the name. Um, uh, let's see. There we go. Let's try that. Okay. Like every good hoofer story, it always starts, and so we were drinking. <laughs> there is an optional middle, which is, then the next thing I remember, and then finally it always ends, and we're just happy to be alive. So, <laughs> so anyways, uh, this story, like many others, started like so we were drinking. And um, I was very fortunate at the year 2000 uh, to be able to sail around the world in a 37-foot catamaran. And, uh, and in March of 2000, well, it would be 14 now, the uh, Huffers organized a big sailing trip to the Bahamas. There were like four catamarans. We all sailed out there and we spent uh, a whole week of sailing and came back, everyone was super excited about like long distance sailing, you know, island hopping and all of these fun things. Um, but the first thing that comes to mind is that it's unsustainable because the price of a charter trip like that is about $100 a person per day for the boat alone and whatever else you have to that. So unless you really have a lot of money in the background, in a sense, you're just not going to be able to do that for much than a week or two week vacation, right? And uh, and then things got a little better because I got excited. It's like, oh man, I was in Hoofers back in 2000. And before that, I had seen three presentations where people came to Hoofers and said, I sailed around the world. And almost invariably, they all started, first thing I did is I saved a million dollars, <laughs> you know, and then we sailed around the world. It's like, oh man, if I have to save a million dollars, it's never gonna happen in my lifetime. Um, our trip was me and three other friends. We actually bought a boat for $100,000, sold it for $100,000. And it actually, uh, for the two years we were there, we each spent about $20,000 uh, for food, provisioning, fixing up the boat, and everything else. Uh, but that was in 2000 when money was really, really cheap. You know, <laughs> it was a dot com boom, and anyone could get a $50 an hour job and all of that. And I was talking to, you know, a much younger generation. Uh, <laughs> and. You know, saying, oh, you guys should go out and explore, you know, and do all these things. And, uh, and it's like, well, where are we going to find $100,000 to even buy a boat? You know, much less save $20,000. And man, everyone's coming out with large student debts. And I said, you know what? I've been in this business for 30 years, man. I, I got to figure out a way to do this, right? And this is the dream that brought off the boat. That conversation, I said, what is, in a sense, like, the lowest cost, boat of lowest cost of ownership, in a sense, like if I have to own this boat and I have to maintain it and I want to take it places, what is the boat that's going to cost me the least that's going to take me somewhere the safest? And uh, um, so that's like the dream, the expectation, you know, and then you're like, oh man, what am I going to do? And then you go out and you try to pick the design, you know, it's like there's thousands and thousands of different boat designs. You know, I mean, there are boats that have been built, you know, like designs for boats for like the last 200 years that you can access. Some of them are free, some are for pay, some of them are super high tech, you know, designed with computers with the latest CAD design, you know, some of them have foils, you know. Um, and, um, and at some point you have to pick a design. Then the other part of it is like, how can you build it, right? I mean, the construction part of it is important and then you can never ignore that once you're done with construction, the boat is just barely there. It doesn't have engines, it doesn't have plumbing, it doesn't have electricals, you know, and all of those things are required to make the boat work. Um, so we're going to talk a lot about um, all of these uh, sort of steps in there, but the first thing I always like to say is like, man, you always should dream big, you know? Always think about it, it's like, oh man, you know, it's like, 
this is what we should do. We should sail around the world, you know? In fact, we should sail around the world twice, you know? I mean, that kind of attitude. Um, and when I looked at this photo, I said, oh man, what I really want to do is like, I can have it hop in the Caribbean, but what I really would like to do is make it all the way to Brazil. And interesting enough, there's a stretch, you know, between the, basically they call it Venezuela and Brazil, where it's a no man's land. In a sense, like, there's no books written about it, there's no cruising guides written about it, you know, the best information you can get is basically satellite pictures, you know, through Google Earth. <laughs> and I was like, you know, that would be the most challenging sailing I've ever done in my life, you know. So let me find a boat that does that, you know. Um, and then the question is like, well, okay, so you have the stream, and now it's like, well, where, where does the boat fit into that? You know, because a lot of people say, well, what I really want to do is travel around the world. It's like, well, is the boat in the central part of it, or is it, you know, a convenient and very expensive way of doing it? Actually, an inconvenient and very expensive <laughs> way of doing it. <laughs> um, you know, so, you know, we have this whole, like, aura of, like, ah, you know, it's like it's a dream, it's like, ah, oh, the boat, you know. But sometimes the, these things are not the same. And finally, like, one of the things I'll keep coming back is, like, building boats is not the same as sailing boats. There are many, many incredibly good sailors who've never built a boat. There are some incredible boat builders who really know very little about sailing. And somewhere in there, there's a spectrum. But your desire to sail around the world does not correlate to your desire to build a boat to sail around the world. Um, um, and then, you know, it's like, okay, so now we have this big dream and then we have to come back to reality, you know? Is it a money thing, you know? Is it a time thing? It's like, where are we going to start reducing and refocusing that dream to something that we can actually accomplish, right? Um, and for me, I always think about it, it's like, be humble and be happy because like, unlike what we expect out of ourselves, building a boat is completely error prone, there's mistakes all over the place, and at the end of the day, you just have to accept, you know, I know it's not perfect, but it's good enough, you know, and life goes on like that, and, and I guess like the big part of boat building is if you don't enjoy boat building, building a boat for anything is just not going to be a fun experience. So in a sense, you really like, you have to like working with your hands, you have to enjoy the process of creating things, um, and this is my next picture. <laughs> so, this is the happiness part of it. This was one of the most desperate days in my life. Brazil had just lost to Germany in the World Cup. <laughs> okay? And here is the, the little girl I live with. She's waving the Brazilian flag like it's the most important thing. You know, wearing her Dutch shorts and the, you know, I, I think it's the U.S. jersey or something. Some other country's jersey. You know, with like no worries in the world. And I was like, you know what? Let's put that in perspective, you know? Brazil lost the World Cup, but, you know, it doesn't really matter, you know? <laughs> I mean, Argentina wasn't even in it. So. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, how do you start boat building, you know, and things like that? This is 1980s. Paul Exeter, an incredible sailor that you guys may or may not know through the sailing club, and I, we decided that we were going to build a boat. The first decision we made is like, huh, if we're going to build a boat, What's the safest boat we can build? Well, one that doesn't need to float. So, so this is a nice boat. So the first boat I built was a nice boat because like, that's the amount of trust I have in myself. You know, that hey. um, And then um, boats come in different forms. This happens to be a, so uh, the last, the previous boat, we still have three weeks we can do it. it took us about four months to build that boat. Um, this is a kit boat and it's actually uh, uh, a lay-down paddle board that I was building, but you can see that at this point, from going to the basement, I upgraded quite a bit, because now I'm building in the living room. You know, my roommates, my roommates made a big mistake of leaving the house alone for two weeks, and I said, I can build a boat in two weeks, man. <laughs> so, off to the living room, move everything apart, man, put some plastic on the floor, um, and here we go. Um, this is uh, a 17-foot uh, rowing, uh, it's called a picnic boat, because back in the days, you were supposed to carry a young lady in the back, you know, while you rode. Uh, and so that was the dream, but uh, mostly I rode by myself. <laughs> and, uh, but this boat, for example, took me three and a half years. Almost a year just to learn how to do the paddles and, you know, make them the same and all of that. Um, 
here's uh, another, uh, this uh, same lay down paddle board and uh, was very happy to have uh, an, an artist involved and took it over six months to paint the thing. Now I feel sorry every time I use it because I'm afraid of scratching it, you know. But, uh, She's in town. <laughs> um, so in the background, you guys might recognize that. But in the foreground, uh, some of you guys might recognize this is four play. This is a 36 foot uh, steel 1959 Chris Craft Roamer. Um, I just saw it yesterday. I was out there and yeah. it's still there. And it's my nemesis. I spent 15 years trying to make the boat better. And for 15 years, she was always a step ahead of me. And now it's for sale. So if you want one. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's supposedly there, you know? Um, finally, this is the best example of the dream and the dream. So this, Paul Exner eventually decided to build this boat. It's a 34 foot Cape George. He bought it from the bear hull, so he bought the hull, all fiberglass, and he did everything else in the middle. It took him 11 years to build this boat. Um, and throughout those 11 years, he was consistently in this uh, situation where he felt guilty if he was working because he wasn't working on the boat. When he was working on the boat, he felt guilty that he wasn't making money to put on the boat to work on the boat. You know, um, so. It, it, it was a tough situation. Eventually, it's the most wonderful boat I've ever seen. You know, I mean, it's an incredible pleasure to sail it. And uh, now he makes a living out of teaching people how to ocean sail with this boat out of uh, Tortola, Vivian. Uh, modern Geographic, if you ever hear about that. Um, so, picking a design, you know, like somehow you have to put all of those big things together and you have to like solidify and like, okay, what, what is the big tenant? The thing that if I accomplish, no matter what else, you know, this boat is going to work for me. Usually for me, it's like, well, does this boat get, get me laid multiple times? And, uh, and, and now I'm boat number seven. So, so that's not a good thing. But, um, but oddly enough, a lot of these boats, um, in a sense, People have built a multitude of them, so sometimes you can actually sail one before you commit to building one. Um, the thing I liked about my designer, uh, his name is Richard Woods, is that every boat he designed, he also built, and he also sailed extensively. The way I bumped into uh, this design called Shadow was because he had this documentary that he spent three months sailing 3,000 miles, basically from England all the way to Russia and back, well, to Estonia. And I was like, man, you know, it's a proven design. It's what I want. Um, now here is probably the biggest lesson of boat building that you can probably get. So here we have three simple designs. The, the one I picked, an O'Day 24 and an O'Day 26. Um, the biggest thing I want you guys to look here is that we always want bigger. We want bigger houses, bigger cars, and everything. But when you're building a boat, not only is the cost and the size of the boat exponential, it's by volume. Because not only does the boat get longer, it gets wider and it gets taller. So it's actually something to the cube, it's by volume. So for example, here is a simple example. From a 24 foot boat to a 26 foot boat. So all you did was add two extra feet. The amount of ballast required to hold it goes up by 50% just because you added two extra feet to that. Um, and in boat building, the biggest rule you have is that if you're really, really good, and I'm talking really good, you only go into materials three times. One out of the truck, to your workbench, to the workbench, to the boat, and the boat out. That's obviously never going to happen, right? Imagine you're going to move most of your materials at least ten times. So if you're talking about building a boat, in a sense like you're talking about moving uh, 4,800 pounds times ten, you know, by the time you're done with your boat. So if you're working by yourself, in a sense, just the physical labor of doing that is tremendously expensive. But in addition to that, all of those materials have a cost, right? So adding two feet to your boat adds a significant cost to your boat. So at a certain point, you have to say, you know, it's like, well, okay, that was great, but can I find a smaller one? You know, because every foot you can reduce uh, will make life easier and better. Huh? Um, 
And obviously materials is cost. So um, one of the things that I always say is that, you know, people say, oh, your boat's not gonna have a shower. Yeah, but I saved enough money that I can go to a hotel and take a shower every week and I'll still be so far ahead of the game, right? Um, so, when you're building a boat, there are many, many different places you can start. One of them is the bare hull, meaning you can go out and someone will have a mold for a fiberglass hull and something and they'll lay it out and they'll bring it out, you know, and you can just have to put the middle and the top inside. Uh, you can buy a kit, you know, that uh, in a sense all the panels are CNC cut, plywood panels, things like that, all the materials are there for you. Uh, you can get blueprints, most of the modern blueprints, uh, because they come out of computer design, it's called lofted, which means that you already have all the points that you need to plot the boat out. Um, and uh, I'm going to go over this once I show you guys the design. And finally, the blueprints of design only, which might be something as easy as a sketch. You know, you never know exactly in what, how much detail they put together. Um, and finally, you can design your own. You know, a lot of people design their own canoes or whatever boats because they're like, ah, I really like this design, but I'd like to move it, make it a little bit this way or the other. Um, the other part of it is uh, always interesting in a sense like, what are you going to build it out of? You know, in a sense like, wood has been one of the primary uh, boat building materials for centuries. Now we have plywood, solid fiberglass, composites, aluminum, steel. Um, steel for me is always the most interesting one in that uh, it, it's a material that is really cheap, people really like working with it. Most of the boats in the world are made out of steel. Every commercial ship is made out of steel, but it doesn't scale down. <coughs> in a sense, like that 35 foot roamer that I showed you guys earlier is about as small of a boat you can do in steel. And the reason for that is that at a certain point, the steel, as opposed to bending and flexing, starts ripping like the Titanic. Mm -hmm. So if you hit something, it becomes more like an aluminum can, right? That in a sense, you just pierce a hole through it, rather than it just bending out. Um, so, here is, is that, uh... yeah, so shadow, woods design, uh, give a lot of credit. The first time I saw the boat, I thought it was a beautiful boat. Um, and here I'm just giving you an idea here, because we're going to talk about a couple things, um, and it will be easier uh, if I show you this first. So the boat really has two main cross beams here. And those cross beams are really what hold the boat together and prevent it from lateral movement. And, um, but interesting enough, because of the location of the cross beams, it's not where the mast lies. So there's an additional beam called the mast beam where uh, basically the whole pressure of the mast sits. If you guys are familiar with beach cats, most of them, they actually bring this back enough so that the forward beam becomes the mast beam. Um, but in this case, they're separate. Um, and just to point out that it's a catamaran, which means it has two hulls. Um, but here's the meat. When you start boat building, in a sense, you have to get into the mind of the boat designer. And every boat designer, whether he does it on paper, which in case this one was done on paper since it was 1984, the original design, uh, or they do it on computers, right? Um, so there's a couple of things that are not obvious here, but you have to try to figure out what is the boat that I'm building. So on the top picture, it would be if you took a picture sideways of the profile of the boat, and there's a couple lines here that are important. One of them is the water line, and then the other one is the shear, which is the very top one that determines the top. The designer goes and he translates down to what would be a picture from the top, but at different lines. So this. Over here is the water line. Oops. Let's see. Right here. Uh, let's see. Am I have a stick? No. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Got to move over to the side so I can read it a little bit. Um, Don't worry. It mostly floats. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but so here's the shear on the top. Here's what the, he calls the knuckle, which would be that line in the middle, and then finally the water line. Okay. And and all that does is it gives them an idea of like, what do I want the boat to look as it hits the water and approaches the water. The catamaran um, has a couple of interesting things and every hole shape is designed to take advantage of certain things. This one, for example, if you look at the profile of the bottom, you can see that almost every section here is a cylindrical section. Can someone tell me why that would be? 
Minimum wetted perimeter. Strength. Basically, it's the least wetted surface you can get for a weight. So in a sense, like, what he's trying to do in this design is minimize the amount of wetted surface area. And since water is like your biggest enemy in a sailboat, in a sense, the drag created by water, in a sense, if every surface can be cylindrical, you're going to have the minimal amount of uh, wetted surface area, which means for the amount of power you're putting on the boat, you're going to be able to go the fastest. Well, then he has to uh, take a little bit of work because, interesting enough, once you get to the bow, you also want to add some wave piercing capabilities. You know, you want to be able to part the water. Um, and um, so the design, the designer, you know, he's balancing all of these things. Um, and so in this particular design, he did this part, did this job, and then in a very long floor, plotted the same thing out, the size of the boat, and then he went and he picked all of these numbers, and then with these numbers, he created what are going to be the forms of the boat. And we're going to see the forms in a little bit, uh, in the next couple slides. But today with computers, normally uh, this process is done by the computer. In the old days, this would be calling lofting the hull, in a sense, coming up from an original design, stretching it out, putting it in the floor, getting like really long bands, trying to uh, get all the, the curves nice and smooth. Um, but computers have taken care of that. Um, but really, I think the big points I was going to show here is really, in a sense, the bottom profile of this boat is all circular. Um, different boats have V-shaped, you know. Some people say, well, the V-shape helps you part the seas better. So there's all compromise. Some of them are flat on the bottom because it's easier to build. In a sense, like if you have a flat bottom, you now have an easy place to, to stand. Now, my boat, for example, I have the flat bottom, but I have to build the floor because it's really uncomfortable to stand on a curved surface. Um, uh, the construction of choice is uh, basically, it's called a fiberglass composite boat. So it's really mostly a fiberglass boat with a wood core. The same boat can be done with a foam core if one chose to. Oh, actually, yeah. I'm going to pass these around. I almost forgot I have them. Um, I would avoid opening up the fiberglass. Most people have mild sensitivity to fiberglass, but these are wide clean. Uh, just to give you an idea of the two different types of cloth uh, that you can use. And then here you can see, these are slightly thinner cedar strips um, than I use, but you can see how if you couple them together, you can get the curved section of the boat. So as we talk about this, just pass them around. Um, and and then what you do is you lay this fiberglass on top of the wood, you mix up your epoxy, you magically roll it on, and you have this composite thing. And, and it's really amazing to see like these uh, flimsy wood pieces suddenly become very structurally sound in the sense that you can get a hammer to it and they just bounce back. And you're like, whoa, <laughs> that's really cool. And it's the amazing property of fiberglass and uh, epoxy, which is this wonderful material. But so, do you, you guys know what epoxy is in general terms? It's basically a true part glue. In a sense, you get one part A and you one part B and you mix it up together. And it has these amazing properties uh, for boat building. One of them, it sticks to wood incredibly well. And the second one, which is really important, it's, uh, it, it, it's hydro, uh, well, it, hydrophobic? Hydrophobic? Yes. Phobic. Phobic. In the sense that it repels water and it's a really good moisture barrier. Um, and one of the problems we always have with wood is that wood likes to move. In a sense like when wood gets wet, it expands. When wood gets dry, it shrinks. So the traditional wood boats, like the biggest thing they had was a really good bilge pump because they always leaked. <laughs> but, you know, the whole thing about woodwork, especially if you're looking at rock planks and everything, is in a sense like, when the wood swells, is it going to be in the shape that I want? And when it dries, you know, is it going to still be in the shape that we want? Um, so, this is a picture of two different stages of epoxy. Um, one of the really nemesis of working with epoxy is that fiberglass likes to float on it. So, let's say you're trying to glue this big piece and you 
you know, you put your fiberglass over your wood, and then you go and you pour epoxy over it. If you keep pouring epoxy, in a sense, all you're doing is having the fiberglass float on top more and more and more on it. So you're spending a lot of money on this very expensive glue, uh, over 100 bucks a gallon. Uh, and not only that, uh, epoxy in its natural form is very brittle. So eventually, you end up with something um, that uh, uh, is very heavy, non-functional. Uh, so the way this whole process works, and this is how a good day of working with fiberglass starts, you start early in the day, and you go, and you put the fiberglass on top, you roll it down, and now it gets to stick. At this point, you've put the, the minimal amount of fiberglass to glue the thing together. Now, another problem with fiberglass, it doesn't like to stick to itself once it dries. So either you sand it, right, or you apply a second coat uh, while it's still in what they call the tacky, rubbery phase, which is about six hours for the product I was using. So six hours after the fact, you have to come and put another layer now uh, just to basically fill in the spot because what you don't want to do is if you sanded that first part of it, I don't know how well you guys can see it, but all you would be doing is sanding the top of the fiberglass, completely eliminating your biggest structural material because you just sanded down the top layer of glass. And the glass is essential for the structure. In fact, it is the structure of the bond, of the, the composite, right? So what you have to do now is quickly, now what? Well, six hours later, you put a second layer on top of it. And, uh, and then six hours later, you put another third layer. And now you have a surface that when you do sand, in a sense, all you're doing is sanding out the epoxy and no longer sanding the fiberglass. Um, and that is probably as technical as I'm going to get about putting the fiberglass together. But it's just this concept that, in a sense, like you can't just put fiberglass on something, walk home, come back a couple days later and continue to drop. You have to dedicate a whole day of manufacturing because you're going to do it. Four or five hours later, you're going to come back and you have to do it again. And four or five hours later, you have to come and finish it up. So, um, so it takes a lot of preparation uh, to get to that point. Um, so Joe, I have a question. Yes, please. So when you did it, you, you, you actually did just one layer of fiberglass cloth and then multiple layers of epoxy? That's right. I mean, you can do multiple layers of glass if need be. Uh, and, uh, but again, in a sense, it all has to be while everything is still in the process of drying. You never let the whole thing dry completely. Um, there's a couple ways of getting around that, and one of them is, uh, you guys might know um, or heard, in a sense, like you can have uh, vacuum bagging, but that requires materials and everything. So the vacuum bag allows you to put an additional uh, glass. You can also use materials um, like peel ply, you know, it's getting a little technical. There are a couple ways of getting around it, but all of them involve money, you know? So, so being that I have, I'm a guy that has more time than money. Um, so, invariably, there's nothing you can do. You have to uh, do the strips, right? And in my case, uh, ended up with this little jig, and you can see my little saw worked really hard. Um, and you get about, for me, it was about 500 strips that I was going to require to put the boat together. Um, one of the things you'll see here is that we lose a lot of the lumber as we're trying to strip it, you know, because every time the saw goes by, you know, you're losing some lumber. And how much? You know, lots and lots of sawdust. I mean, I wish there was a good market for that because I made so much of it. <laughs> um, but um, when I showed you guys on the original design, there were all these forms. In a sense, like, what you have to do for a surf composite boat is you're creating a female mode. And the female mode is based on all of these uh, forms. And each one of them very carefully cut and, uh, and very carefully aligned. And eventually, you have a structure that you can uh, staple down uh, the strips and glue them together to do the original shape. Um, One of the things I like doing is actually, when I make these frames, I like putting a center hole through it because you can imagine in a boat, the ability to look down the line and say, do I have a straight line? That happens nowhere in a boat unless you purposely put something in the middle because otherwise everything is curved outside, upside, right? Um, and here's like 
the point in case I took that picture, this is, I did it. At least at one point in my life, that was a straight hole. <laughs> uh, and here you can see uh, the process of stripping the boat. And uh, so you have these strips, the bottom ones, because the boat is relatively flat, they were about an inch and a half wide. Um, as you get to the curves, then they're about three quarters of an inch wide, similar to the material that I passed around. Yes. Are those the move cut? No. Uh, because they were basically flat, right, there was no need to do it because they're butted together. And in my case, I actually glued them with uh, just waterproof wood glue. Uh, some people like using the epoxy. The problem with the epoxy is it's a hard surface that once you start sanding, the whole boat gets undulated because every time you have epoxy, the sandpaper will attack the wood differently than the epoxy. Um, we keep going, and you can see here, here are some of the things. The sign adding strips, at some points, you, you know, you have to start making very precise cuts so that the strips fit the shape of the boat, you know? So a lot of them are tapered, many things, uh, and uh, we keep on going, you know, but here's part of the result. Here you can see at this point I've actually, uh, all of these were staple uh, holes that I used to staple them to the frame. So now they're all covered uh, with a fairing agent, sand it down, and uh, uh, let me go back one. So at this point, the outside of the boat is ready to be fiberglassed, and it's actually a nice, easy operation because everything is upright, and it's just down, you know, gravity is your friend. Uh, and uh, once I was able to fiberglass the outside, one of the beautiful things that I was able to find out is that I was able to flip it on the side and already had enough strength that now I could fiberglass the inside. Otherwise, it would have been almost an impossible job to go inside and underneath the boat to try to fiberglass it. Uh, so when I did that, I was like one of the happiest people. Oh, wow. <laughs> it's awesome. <laughs> um, and again, so right now the cloth is just draping over it. Um, and I'm going to take just two seconds to talk about this. You guys saw, in a sense, this is a, what they call woven fiberglass. And uh, this is a, what they call biaxial. And the difference here is that you can get uh, the same fiberglass, in a sense they call them weights, which is like the thickness of the fibers and everything. But at the end of the day, because the fibers here are going and crisscrossing each other, it makes a weaker uh, composite because uh, the biaxial, on the other hand, all the fibers are going straight and flat, so when they're forced to stretch themselves, in a sense, like they, they don't have that give that you would normally have in a mat. Uh, and you can see here, in a sense, uh, sort of the pattern of the biaxial glass. Uh, <coughs> and here, this is after fiberglassing, and now with uh, a little bit of filler in there, but you can definitely see the 45 degree pattern of the fiberglass holding in place. So Joe, the, the bottom of the hulls are the biaxial and the Both. Top? Inside and outside. Are both? Both, yeah, biaxial. So, yeah, But the top is, is not woven? No, uh, well the hulls, right? Right, the bottom, well, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, a um, couple of the things that, you know, when you're boat building, it's like, oh, you know, you have to make all kinds of jigs. This one, for example, is going to allow me to flip the boat upside down in the next step, right? But that's not something that's in the blueprints, you know? They, they just say, hey, you know, flip the boat over. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, you know? <laughs> so, so this is one of the things that you have to do in the process of boat building. It's like, oh, I need a jig, I need a little something, you know? Um, one of the things, let me just contrast this. So at this point of my life, it's October, it's getting really cold, and I really had not figured out how am I going to finish building this boat inside this garage that has got a foot on either side, you know, and no insulation, no heat, and fiberglass, like, it really wants to be at least 60 degrees, and I was like, oh, I'm stuck, you know. But out of nowhere, this guy who, his name is Buzzmans, he comes up and says, hey, Joe, man, I heard you're building a boat, let me take a look at it. And I go, hey, you know, I just finished my boat. And I have a garage, you want to use it? And I was like, <laughs> you got to be kidding. <laughs> the way I met the guy was 15 years ago. Uh, was not, not that, yeah, 15, like uh, late 90s. He had the boat park in the pier. 
He went out drinking. I came home from drinking as part time. It was the biggest storm. And I realized this boat was not only going to sink, but it was going to take the pier that was attached to also in the middle of the storm. It was one of those uh, residential piers. It was just yanking at the thing. So what did I do? I go in there and I sink his boat. You know, because now it was comfortably in the bottom of sandy bottom. The next day we got a bunch of guys, we lifted it out, you know, and he cleaned the engine, you know. But I met the guy because I sunk his boat. <laughs> <laughs> Yay, torpedo! Yeah, again, you know, the torpedo story continues. You know? <laughs> um, so the benefit of that is I got to finish the boat in this wonderful space that was purposely built to build his boat. You know, and he had just finished it that season. Um, here you can see the whole fiberglass boat on the inside and the outside and it's sitting in the garage ready to be finished and one of the things that big pieces like that tend to do is they tend to warp and things like that so at this point what I'm trying to make sure is that during this whole process of moving storing it that the boat is still level and straight otherwise any long thing like that really tends to twist you know um, what would you have done if it had twisted uh, you just use a bunch of things and you, you, you can twist it back um, to a certain extent. Uh, and here you can see the hull sitting, you know, just ready to go. I was like, oh my god, okay, now we're to the next step. In a typical boat building process, you're only about 10% done when you get to this phase. In a sense, like when you buy a bare hull, you know, so how do you avoid being at the 10% phase? One of them is you build a canoe, then you're probably 80% there, <laughs> you, you know. Uh, or, you know, you try to build boats that have little interior because building the interior of, of a house, well, of a boat is like building the interior of a house. You can spend as much money and time as you want and never really be done with it, right? Um, so, as part of the design, uh, what we're looking at here are the bulkheads. And bulkheads are very important in the boat because they basically prevent the boat from compressing sideways. And the number of bulkheads you put in really determine, uh, in a sense, like where things are going to be in the boat, you know, where you're going to have a bunk, where you're going to have a place for storage. Um, most of you who stepped into a keel boat, you've all seen the bulkheads and they're strategically spaced. Um, but the main important part of the bulkheads is to prevent the boat from being compressed sideways. Um, the interesting thing you're going to see is like when you get to these where you have to be able to walk through it, you have this open span that the designers hate because in a sense like you have a compression point that has no support. But that's their problem, not mine. <laughs> uh, here you can see I was dry fitting them to make sure that you know they all kind of fit. Um, and even bulkheads, you know, they're not a simple step. In a sense like this simple bulkhead has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight pieces attached to it. All of them custom made one off, you're never going to do it. Well, in this case, I made two of them, but normally you're only going to do one your whole life. Um, and also what you learn is that anything you're going to put inside the boat, the closest you can get to the finished product, the better. Because one of the hardest things to do is work inside a cramped boat and try to be sanding, varnishing, you know, and so on. So uh, it really pays off to uh, be close, as close as possible to the end. In a catamaran, um, there are very special, specific bulkheads that have to deal with how the cross beams are going to be attached. So in this case, the designer spent, uh, actually there's three pages that deal with how to attach uh, the cross beams, and I'm showing you just one. But you can see all the reinforcements and all the extra pieces, and that's because you have those two beams that are going to cross the boat, and they have to support the boat from twisting once you get in waves. Um, and here, you can see, uh, it's a little uh, focused, but can't fix that, I think, because uh, I think the picture was bad, but anyways. But here you can see, in a sense, like this is where one of the cross beams is going to lie. Uh, here we are progressing. You can see adding some bulkheads, starting to work my way back, right? Um, and then, uh, now you can see a little bit more of the structure because I added the frames on the top, and I'm thinking, um, one of the reasons I left the back open is because it was easy for me to walk as opposed to climbing into the boat. I could always walk from the back and crawl in. So you're only showing well, one hull, but you built both of them simultaneously, No, right? no, I only had space for one. But 
as I was doing that, um, you can see here, way is stuck in the corner. I always cut pieces for both. So, you know, since by the time I was finished with them, I had all the pieces cut off for the next, because he had a perfectly good pattern at that point. And I just crossed my fingers that they would be close enough. And they were close enough. Uh, Joe, are the, the all symmetric? Yes. Yeah, and this will basically, um, at this point, this could have either been the port of the starboard hull and no one would have known the difference. Um, and here you can see the boat finally with all of its framework in place. Um, now, you remember I told you like the problem with like these open bulkheads? You can see what the, he added here is um, a shelving unit on the side. And the shelving unit just looks like a little shelf. But really what it does, it creates a bulkhead that's in a horizontal plane as opposed to a vertical plane, right? So like these little pieces here are actually incredibly structural because uh, otherwise the boat would want to compress there and it's like the worst part for the boat compress where it's the widest, you know, has the most exposure to wave. And here it does that. Um, at this point, you can't see inside, but I had all the floors done. I actually had the head installed. Um, and because the head took up so much space here, I killed one of the bunks. This would have normally been a bunk, but now it's a lazarette. And I said, well, if boat needs a lazarette anyways, you know. So, <laughs> and you can see here, this is going to be the rudder post. Um, here is a mounting for a fan. Uh, so at this point, you, you're pretty well convinced that you've done almost everything you could do in the interior with the knowledge you have at the time, right? I mean, it's like, okay, because now, Things are going to get much tighter. Once you start decking the boat and it's applied with deck, um, and here I can pass this around, but it's just a marine plywood. Um, the real trick of the plywood, when you look at that, is notice how it has a lack of flaws. It doesn't have the big knots. If you look at it sideways, there are no voids on anything either way. And finally, it's done with a waterproof glue so that if you soak that for months on end, it still won't fall apart. If you go out um, and get an interior plywood, you keep it in water for a couple hours, it starts warping around. Um, but here we are uh, adding the deck, and then here's one of my favorite pictures, you know, it's like I got a boat. <laughs> or so I thought, you know, because <laughs> um, it's like, uh, and I'll point out that normally the shop wasn't this clean, but every time <laughs> I went to the kitchen, you know, it's like, I got a <laughs> All the messes. Just a little bit downhill from this. Um, but you can see where uh, the cross beams are going to go in this position and that position. You can pretty much see, hey, I got a boat, right? Um, and it's a fantastic, rewarding feeling at that point. You know, it's like, and you just know you're halfway through that step because now I have to build the whole other one. Um, here is the process of fiberglassing. If you guys were really attentive to the whole thing, you would have noticed that now this is actually the starboard hole, the other one was a port hole. So this is a picture later in time. But one of the things I want to point out here is here's the kill in the construction. Rarely did I work on a boat that I didn't have three or four separate projects that I was doing in parallel. And the reason for it is because, you know, now you have six hours between the first thing you do here. What are you going to do with those six hours, you know, and just hang out? You know, you might as well be doing something. And most of the things, once you glue it once, especially like the wood pieces, these you don't have to come back, you glue them once, but when you're done for the day, right? So part of the idea was to always have multiple projects going so that as you're putting the whole thing together, you're always busy. Um, this project took me a year and a half, about uh, 1,500 hours, I suspect, of my time. Um, so really it meant, you know, 20 hours a week of additional, <laughs> you know, um, not on the tempo, but you have to sacrifice, like I didn't sail for two years. <laughs> and that for me was like the most telling part of it. You know, I went out sailing, it's like, oh, this is cool, man. I haven't done this in a while for the guy who used to sail every day, you know. So um, here you see the keel. Um, and the interesting thing about a catamaran keel is that it has it, no lead. It's empty. It's basically airspace. Because the only reason it's there is to replace a dagger board. In a sense, all it, its only purpose is to prevent the boat from going sideways, and in this case, uh, have a place so that if you want to land the boat on a beach, 
in a sense it's solid enough that the boat can uh, support its own weight on the keel. Um, fiberglass in the top. So while the fiberglass down below was very structural, the fiberglass uh, on the deck uh, has more to do with creating a thickness of epoxy and creating an abrasion resistant surface. So the plywood that I had before, if I had just painted it, it would have been good enough. But to make it a little better, you put a thin coat of fiberglass that allows you to build the thickness of epoxy that makes it quite waterproof, but also makes it very abrasion resistant, meaning like if you drop a hammer on it, it'll just bounce away. But it does not have the structural properties of the fiberglass in the hull that were really like, without that fiberglass, the boat would fall apart. Without this one, you know, you might think the boat and take care of it. Um, here's a, just another example of like one of the drawings. This one is like how to build uh, the big cross beams. And again, as opposed to being a solid piece of wood to save wood and actually to make it stronger, uh, in a sense like these laminated beams end up being stronger than the solid wood. Um, and one of the main things about it is because, uh, as I said before, wood likes to move. So in a sense like by having a composite and gluing it together, you eliminate uh, some of that movement because of the thinner pieces. They don't have the force to split open uh, the, the glue joints. And again, so here's one that's basically done. Here's the second one being built. And you can see in the background, I'm working on the hatch on something, you know, um, and you can just see um, that there was always multiple things going on in the shop. Um, and then, very momentous day, and uh, yeah, look at that. Some of the principles are here. This is the day we pulled the first hull out of the shop, and here's the second one ready to go in. But now you can already see where uh, sort of a, the ventilation hatch, uh, the entrance hatch, the lazarette, a uh, little vent, and all of the things are now in place. This boat now, at this point, you could have flipped it and was very well supported. There was no flex in the hull at all, you know, supporting its own weight. Uh, on the other hand, you can see this one, that it looks a little skinny because it was, because until you put the bulkheads in it to fill out the shape, uh, it did flex when you put it on its side. A uh, couple of details of the woodwork. I mean, nothing is easy, you know. How do you make a flat surface to put in a, <laughs> a flat? I wrote a chapter in the book for this. Um, and the sad part is, if you look really carefully, there's this mark over here. I made all these pictures and I was done. And I was like, God, this is great. Then I realized I put it in the wrong place. <laughs> so I, I quickly tore the whole thing apart <laughs> and redid the whole thing. I was like, really, man? Just because I wanted to write a chapter in the book. But anyways, it's mm. the kind of thing. <laughs> Um, you can see the shelves that I talked about, reinforcing the bulkheads. Um, you can see the main entrance hatch to the side. Over here you can see the floorboards that go on the bottom. You know, So you can see that there's like this plethora of activity happening through the whole process. Um, a simple thing like an entry hatch has probably 40 different pieces that go together to make it happen. Right? All of them custom made, all of them uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, here's one of my favorite parts, because <laughs> it involves a lot of help, Michelle especially. So we were drinking, and I, uh, and I, I was like, man, I have this great boat, but I don't want a white boat, you know? And I was looking at, who do I know, man? Who would be smart enough, you know, to volunteer for a project like this? <laughs> Everyone stepped back, and Michelle all of a sudden goes up in front. But I was like, oh, Michelle, I, all I, want, I don't want a white boat. And I know you're good with the color. She's a professional interior designer. And I looked at her website, and I said, like, oh, man, I'm going to see if she can come up with some great colors for me. And so I'm like, ah, drinking beer, you know, hook for social. And I was like, ah, you know, I got this project. You know, all I wanted some color in my boat. I just don't want it to be white. And she goes, oh, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to come up with these four different designs. And, you know, you pick one. I said, no, <laughs> that's not how it's going to work, you know. You do your best, you come up with one, and we're going to make it happen. And 10 years from now, if I have to repaint the boat, you'll know if I really liked it or not. <laughs> so she came up with this wonderful uh, assortment of colors, and basically it's a, a sunset you know, over the sea. Um, the boat looked like that before she got involved. And uh, you know, it was a white boat, but you need to prime the paint anyways. 
And at this point, I'm pretty proud of myself because it's like, oh man, it's a mean, fast machine. Um, <laughs> painting the boat involved a lot of help. Here are the less professional help, uh, including myself, because we didn't know what we're doing, but we said, I'll throw a first coat in. Um, and then Michelle and Christine came, and now they started using their magic. The boat is painted in latex, which is uh, uh, an unusual choice for boat builders, but the reality of it is that it's such a healthier paint to work with. The technology of latex paints has so far evolved. Um, the only disadvantage I found that there's like two, one of them minor, uh, one of them it scratches easier, it's a softer paint. Uh, the second, if you're trying to do things like that, you really have to work faster because unlike the oil paints, you just don't have time to, you know, do your magic. But wasn't my problem to have. <laughs> 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 uh, off we went with latex paint, and off it uh, started coming up. Um, here, Christine putting some of the details, and you can see already where in some of the spots where I didn't take enough time to dry it out, where the, the straps had rubbed off some of the color, but it did not rub off the white, you know, which is also latex, you know, so um, it was really more a question of not letting the paint dry. Um, and here you can see uh, one of my favorites, really. I mean, I've sat in this particular place for so many years and seen that exact image. <laughs> um, with a name and a cocktail, excellent. And again, multiple projects trying to figure out how to fit a rudder, how to fit the forward mass feed. A um, couple of the challenges, right? I mean, you have a 300 pound boat uh, and you got to move it, you know? Here I am moving a 300 pound thing by myself, you know? And like every good sailor, Lots of pulleys, lots of ropes, you know, um, and basically lift it up. And at that point, I was able to start spinning it. Uh, the interesting thing, it was hard to stop spinning it. <laughs> but anyways, since I was by myself, it was going to happen, you know, or, or they'd find my body somehow. But um, adding the keel to the whole thing, and uh, again, this was the second hole, so the first one hole, they were doing like the detailing parts of it. The second hole was being put together. So all of these projects were always happening in parallel. And um, part of the, the problem, well, I shouldn't say the problem, the motivation was that when uh, Buzz first let me use his garage, he said, okay, go. I mean, it's, how much time do you think it's going to take? I said, ah, a year, man. Why would it take more than a year? You know? And June was coming around sailing season, and I was like, ah, you know what? It was such a wonderful place, man. I think uh, I'm going to stop working on a boat for a couple months, enjoy sailing, and come back to it in the winter when I have nothing to do. And then Buzz goes, ah, you know, yeah, because, you know, by October I wanted to start this other project. And I was like, ah, <laughs> all right. <laughs> okay, so now, now there's a lot of motivation because, like, I can, could see how to finish this any other place as comfortably, right? So it's like, okay, I'll be done by October. And then uh, if I'm going to have it done by October, I'm going to try to have it done by August. At least I have a little bit of sailing, you know. Um, Part of building the boat also includes things like building the rudder, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so all of these things, you're like, how do you build a rudder? You know, it's like, well, you know, you do a little reading and you get some wood, get some epoxy, glue it all together, and if it works, it works. Otherwise, you take it apart and do it again. Um, here's the construction of the mass beam, um, and you can see almost all of these things are designed to save weight. So the mass eventually is going to compress down. Uh, in this direction. Uh, just a little tidbit about lumber, which is never realized this. Basically, lumber in tension is twice as strong as lumber in compression. Because I was like, why isn't this thing going that way? You know? Because yeah. I was like, ah. It's like, ah. But believe it or not, in a sense, like when trying to stretch wood is much harder than trying to compress wood. I guess that's the way trees live. <laughs> uh, a simple example of the bracket, so the mass beam actually slides in here, holds itself by gravity. A um, couple more things with the floorboards. You know, so this, this is the middle of the boat, so this is called an open deck catamaran, in that it doesn't have a cabin in the middle. Uh, so it's basically just a flat plywood floor. Um, getting there, you can see the really slick profile of the boat, you know, and now I'm trying to figure out how to build the middle and this was the first time really that I had a chance to have both of the holes side by side. And it was pretty exciting. I was like, ah, oh, that's cool, man. <laughs> and there we go, we got a boat. 
you know, uh, first time sailing, you still didn't have a jib for the boat. Yeah, but you know, you go with what you have. The boat's sitting nicely there. Um, and uh, it's gonna happen again this Saturday, right? Yeah, exactly. No, it's almost ready to go. Uh, I mean, as a side note, like I just a week ago, well, a couple weeks ago, I said, ah, I'm gonna make a list of all the things I want to do on the boat. Somehow, by page three, I like, huh, looks like I'm gonna have to prioritize this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> um, Why didn't you start making the list earlier? Yeah, exactly. Um, Might be sailing by Pi Day. I moved through this fairly quickly uh, to give you guys some opportunities for questions. Um, a lot of this could be much more technical, a lot of it could be more exciting, but at the end of the day, I think uh, this is really, uh, Hoofer is such a great opportunity to learn all of this stuff. I mean, the reason I can build a boat, the reason I sailed around the world, the reason I'm going to take this boat somewhere is by and large because of the existence of this organization. It's a great place to learn. I mean, the years I spent in the shop were invaluable. Right now, uh, I actually feel that the Keelboat program is a premier place to learn all of this. In a sense, like they're fixing boats from, I mean, you guys who are working in keelboats, just raise a hand so we, yeah, a couple of, yeah, more, all right. So, in a sense, like there is a, a lot to be learned from this. Um, and, you know, the learn by fixing, you know, that's really the first step. Oh, I want to work on boats. I want to learn how fiberglass. Well, I'm trying to fix something, you know, and eventually you get to the point where like, oh, you know, I'm fixing this kind of thing. I should just build new. <laughs> Uh, start small, volunteer, you know, um, it's, it's amazing, um, every time I needed help on this boat, people showed up. I mean, basically, any time I said, you know guys, I need like five people to show up, you know, Saturday morning before breakfast, you know, people showed up. And, but it's still mostly a, uh, a lonely job, you know, it's like, can't expect people to give up their kids, their dogs, their lives, you know, to help you on your boat. But on the other hand, uh, when, you, when you need help, it seems like that this community is, is very good at providing that. Um, I'm going to show a quick video. Let me see here. Is that, yeah, let me see if I can. Better not be the christening. It is like Let me see if I can do this. And I have the videographer, I mean, so this is how you launch your boat, man, you know, and this is how many people it takes, you know, because like there's a lot of beer around. <laughs> I was able to take the boat out with Joe, Joe and I, but to put it in, apparently we need like at least 15, you know. <laughs> and a beverage. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but obviously an incredibly happy day. Um, a couple of things here. This bottom paint is actually not bottom paint. It's actually copper powder mixed with epoxy, and it's supposed to last like 10 years. That's like uh, 10 years, it's worth it. Very expensive, 500 bucks for the copper powder to put into the whole thing, but um, so far so good. Um, at this point, I didn't even have a mass, like we were missing pieces to put the mass up and everything, and I was like, ah, you know what? It's going in the water no matter what, man, because, <laughs> um, yeah. All right, any questions of any sort? I mean, yes? Um, maybe I missed this at the start, but why did you choose the catamaran? I saw your comparison oh, okay. with day, but. No, okay, so the catamaran has a, a lot to do with my history of sailing catamarans. Um, the main thing is that uh, for the same size boat, it's significantly lighter, okay? And being a lighter boat has some tremendous advantages. One of them, the sails are smaller, the anchors are smaller, the cables are smaller, and because of that, everything is also cheaper. For the same length? Of for the same, yeah, for the same length. Uh, and, and it's a spacious boat, like um, in the sense that you can, you can't imagine being in the tropics. This particular style of boat, the way most people use it is like when they get to where they want to go, they never really go inside. They actually pitch a tent in the, the deck area, and that's where they hang out. Um, shallow draft is important. Like There are many, many places you can't go if you're starting to look at four or five feet of water. Um, and it's, uh, in a sense, uh, for me, sailing catamaran is, some people say, well, it's not kind of like sailing because you're, you know, and, you don't, you don't feel the sail. But on the other hand, if you're going on a long distance cruise, in a sense, a boat that you can walk around, you can stand up, you know, you're not having to hold on to anything. Um, and 
And because of that, it's just a significantly more comfortable boat um, than any monohull will ever be. I mean, they say, well, it doesn't go up wind right. I mean, so people say the same thing about cruising boats. Uh, my experience in all of that is that um, sailing upwind is just something you have to learn. You know, and mostly um, if you've never raced, you've never really learned how to sail upwind because you never know how much better someone else can be. You know, so so sailing upwind is uh, always going to be a controversy. But America's got all of these people have completely gotten rid of that in the sense that any catamaran will beat a monohull of equal. You know equal rating at any given day. So, uh, yeah, you're splitting the boat in the water, big party as usual. Uh, <laughs> you missed the actual ball. christening. Oh, yeah, no. And that's the 30 inch, 32 tall boys. I, I, well, I he was drinking, that's a problem. Uh, <laughs> we have, it yeah, supports we two kegs and 24 yeah. people. Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'll be pouring the PBR all over. Is that how I'm going to hold it? Yeah. Yeah. Not <laughs> The bottles have big falling in the water. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> For you guys who've never sailed a catamaran, um, I highly recommend the opportunity. Um, but interesting enough, uh, the catamaran we sailed around the world was a much bigger catamaran, and most of the bigger catamarans have this big cockpit in the middle. And for me, that totally kills the experience of sailing. In the sense that the only person who really sees the sailing is maybe the skipper who's steering the boat. But everyone else is behind that sheltered place, and just like, it eliminates the fun of sailing for me, you know? I mean, I, I, I enjoy kind of like being out there. Um, and, but it's different, it's a very different kind of sailing. Sometimes you don't realize how fast you're going because the boat is just moving, you know? Um, all right. There's a two-part question. You said that you hadn't heard your story about how you sank that boat. <laughs> uh, how would you? How did you do that? And how would you sink this boat really fast if you had to? This one you could. I mean, uh, that seems like a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Uh, Tell the story of sinking the boat. Captain. Give it to me. <laughs> yeah. Let me see if I can get this. this one. Would work where I drill because there is no plug. Uh, uh, <laughs> just pull through through holes. Uh, no, it would never sink because it's. Uh, by the material construction, no, it's inherently... I'm talking about the other one. Oh, no, the other one, uh, you know, it was, it was a motorboat. It was half full of water. All I had to do was sit in the gun. You know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Made the big scoop. Yeah. You know, yeah, there are certain advantages. You guys are doing these two holes. Uh, let me, uh, this one, I think Aki is your other one with the, when we put the mask up. Uh, Oh, this is a great video. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, okay. Anyways, it'll give you a little bit of a headache, but that's good because it's almost beer time. <laughs> so, so this is us. Like, how do you put a mask up boat that never had a mask up, right? I mean, you have to figure out a way to get it up there and measure it out, you know. Uh, but this turned out to be a bigger party than we expected, but it's good, you know. <laughs> Uh, First yeah. time for speed, yeah. second time yeah. for accuracy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so get it up there, kind of measure it out, um, put things in place. Um, so you know, a couple other questions, like for example, uh, uh, I think at the end of the day, like I have about twenty thousand dollars invested on the boat, and that includes uh, the new purchase of some new sails right now. So that is another two and a half, but. You know, brand new engine. Uh, I actually went with a propane engine, which I think is like the most wonderful thing for a small outboard. You guys never heard about that? I, uh, I'd invest uh, some time and energy into it. The main advantage is that the gas never goes old. You know, you never have a problem that, like for an engine that you use very little, right? In a sense, like the propane is always ready. It doesn't gunk up carburetors, doesn't do any of that, you know. Um, Where do you store your tank? Uh, it, it, it's like just a little canisters. So, you can't yeah. Yeah. yeah, so uh, I'm not sure if they'll have an image, but basically right beside the engine, I actually shifted the engine a little bit off center so that I can actually put the tank right beside it. I haven't finished that project yet, but, uh, but you have to put it outside. You can't put a tank inside the boat because propane is heavier than air, 
So it will display steer, and if you ignite something, it will go boom. <laughs> but right over here, here's the engine, right to the left of it, or I'm sorry, to the starboard side of it, there's room for a, a propane tank. Well, that, you're talking about a one pound tank, right? No, no, this would be a full 20 pound oh, kitchen. Full 20 pound, yeah. yeah. And uh, to give you an idea, a one pound tank runs for about an hour and a half. So, like in an open day, that takes me yeah. about seven miles, you know, eight miles. Yeah, I think we on the first day we made it halfway across in one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. well, we had 14 people. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it took about a canister and a half the first day, right? Yeah. So, yeah, and probably about like five or six beers. Right. Yeah. <laughs> It's, you know, for for an urban scenario, it doesn't stink, you know, like one of the problems when you're always trying to go slowly somewhere, especially in like, and then it's like you always get that smell from the gas following you, you know, this doesn't happen. I mean, it really smells easier than a tarp, you know, than a grill, you know, like a propane grill. I mean, you know it's kind of there, but. Yeah. Yeah. He's Joe, married, I, buddy. Joe, I got a question for you. Yeah. So you said uh, 1,500 hours for you. Yeah. What What would you say was the volunteer? About five hours. Yeah, five hours. <laughs> no, no, no. No, uh, no um, I, I think overall. Not just uh, mine. Yeah. Electrical. Um, no, uh, it, it's hard to measure, right? Because a lot of times, like effective hours, I put a couple hundred. You know, but I'm sure there's volunteers there for probably double that. You know, but a lot of times you just you just have to have someone to have a conversation with, so you do. Would you, you know. would you think that the, it's uh, comparable to the amount of hours you put in as volunteer hours? No. no. Oh, you mean like total? No, uh, he no, was the first whole the whole all on by himself, right? Yeah, with, with with some help, I mean, but uh, yeah, I think at the end of the day. Uh, how many square feet were your home? Where was your home? Square feet of area? For, oh, shoot. Good question. Uh, well, it's, yeah, I think you can do a simple math in that they're 24 feet long, and on average they're probably, call it three and a half feet on either side, so 24 times seven, um, you know, 160 square feet worth of material, you know, for one. So 300, so. Yeah. Um, so, for example, the, the the cedar, I had to buy about two thousand bucks worth of cedar. Um, about uh, call it so it was one, two, three, four gallons of epoxy each hole. So, like each each facet was a gallon. One, two, three, four. So eight gallons worth of epoxy, eight hundred bucks. You know. Uh, and when I say it's a it's a composite boat. Just to give you an idea, basically about a third of the weight of the boat probably can be attributed to epoxy. Wow. <laughs> you know, if you measured all the gallons of epoxy and you measured the weight of the boat, I bet you about a third of the weight is the epoxy you put in because you use it everywhere. You use it to protect the plywood, you use it to glue the plywood to the hulls. I mean, it's just ever present. And the area of the deck is like it's 12 feet wide by what, like 18 feet or like yeah. 12 feet, probably by 12 feet, and then there's another floor <clears throat> for the, the the trampoline in front. Did you have to ferry your frames at all when you applied your stripping? Oh yeah, so um, uh, it took a couple of weeks really. You put it all there, right, and uh, and then you put the first couple strips, and then it's all like ah, and then you're like ah, all right, you know. Um, and then you slowly taper it out, uh, but but it's one of those where like you know you try to do everything as best as you can because when you do screw up, then it doesn't make a difference, you know. But there are many times where like you, like I put the strip and then it's like oh man this one's off a little bit, but now I'm halfway through stripping the boat, and then it's like okay. Um, often what you can do is if you start having a mistake like that, as opposed to trying to bring it in. You let it float on the offending near, like, so if one frame, for example, is sticking out too far, right, and you didn't notice in time, if you let it float uh, on the frames nearby it, as opposed to trying to push it in, in a sense, you end up with a fair surface. It's a really nice uh, beauty of working with the cedar strips, right, is that they have this natural curve to them, you know. So if 
if they don't look right, in a sense, like if you happen to really push them in, sometimes if you just let them do what they want to do, you end up with a fair hole, and guess what? It's a quarter of an inch fatter than it's supposed to be. No one's ever going to notice, especially the boat, you know? <laughs> so, what did you thicken the epoxy with for those gaps? Okay. Um, no, uh, so this is floating. As, uh, so imagine, <laughs> well, so imagine you have three frames, right? And normally they would go flush against the three frames. But if for some reason, like this frame is a little further out, right? Mm -hmm. As opposed to trying to push it in and trying like to do an S curve like that, mm -hmm. you just let it float, you know? So like, you, you don't have to fear. All you worried is that they get glued to the top and the bottom correctly, right? Uh, so those problems happen often, you know, especially because uh, not only does uh, the strips want to go sideways, more often than not, they also have a twist required for them to fit, you know. And whenever you start putting the two things together, in a sense, like the mold starts to not fit properly. But some of the problems are inherent with the nature of all the materials you're using. For example, particle board, you know, if you have a four by eight particle board sheet, in a humid day, in a dry day, that whole sheet might move over like half an inch, you know, in the sense that it just a lot, really likes absorbing humidity. So, you know, so in a sense like all of this thing is always moving as you're building, you know, like the wood is moving. So what you're trying to do is like minimize the amount of uh, mistakes uh, as you do it. But on the other hand, you have to understand that the whole process has these small variabilities that you just can't control. You know, I mean, if you get, you know, a piece of plywood just from Menards, it's going to be in a completely different humidity by the time you, you know, use it to build a frame. You know, like you get the big two by fours, like your big framing timbers, you know. Um, some people use aluminum timbers, for, you know, substituted with aluminum exactly for that. But, um, but wood on its whole nature is that it's always moving. So, your best bet is to try to capture it at the moment that it looks the best. <laughs> you know. If, now, what are you using for your real strength parts? You know, your bulkheads and your yeah, so, shelving and things like that that are. So uh, the main the main structure of the boat is really based on the composite hull, right? I mean, you start with that. I mean, that composite hull. If you come and you hit it with a hammer, it actually just bounces away. I would test. All the pieces I cut off, I would always test them to destruction to see how they would fail, you know? Because that would be an indication of my, the process that I was doing. So, so that first part goes in there. Then with the marine plywood, in a sense, like the whole design of the boat is just to keep adding strength to that skin. You know, every time you put a bulkhead and every time you frame it there. Uh, uh, so the plywood does that. But the problem with the plywood, it's so thin that it doesn't bond properly to the skin. So more often than not, what you have uh, is you actually have uh, one by twos pine to actually increase that surface area between bonding uh, to the boat and to the plywood piece. So, so, so your, main, your main material is, is cedar and pine? Mm -hmm. What's yeah, so, well, again, cedar, the cedar could have easily been replaced by foam, right? So in a sense, like the same boat could be built on a, fi a foam fiberglass uh, hull, right? And people do it. Uh, but, so the hull itself, the cedar, it's semi-structural, you know, but it's mostly there to give the shape and it's mostly there to give the separation between the two pieces of fiberglass on the inside and the outside. Um, and then uh, the, the beams, Sitka spruce, just because it's super hard to find anything else that 20 foot length that's flawless, you know. So off to Oregon we go to cut a nice tree. <laughs> so, um, all right. What are your long-term plans? The, well, my long-term plans, I don't know, but my, my near to short-term plans, um, I'm hoping to put it in the water soon, finish the things on my list, but uh, I think the boat is going to end up living in the Caribbean, and it's basically a promise uh, to myself and to my friends, meaning that we would have a lot more fun if we had a boat like this in the Caribbean, you know, as a group. Uh, and I think, uh, again, the dream of the design was to come up with something that is simple to sail as a sloop. That in a sense, like, I would not hesitate in giving the keys to any responsible person to sail the boat. But even better than that, you know, like the conversation was, imagine you were just coming out of college 
and my friend had an old VW van, and they said, well, it's parked in Arizona. If you get it, you can drive it wherever you want as long as, you know, when you come back, it's in somewhere put safe, you know. But imagine, like, how much life would be a little bit more fun, you know, if you had opportunities like that. Oh, okay, man, I'll, I'll go out there. But to have this ability to not sail back and forth, to sail forward, it's such a wonderful thing in life, you know, where in a sense, like, you don't have to plan your vacation to come back to where you started. In a sense, like, ah, we're going to take this boat somewhere else. And once we get there, there's going to be the logistics of all of where you park and everything, but it might be that once you're done with your two-week vacation, some other, you know, entrepreneurial group of workers would just pick up the boat from there. Um, my personal plan is to test it out basically by uh, having it in the Caribbean this winter, well, the, this coming winter, uh, and see if I can sail it to Brazil. I think it would be a wonderful sailing trip, uh, but I think it's a sailing trip that has more to do with people than the boat because I think the only way that's going to be a successful trip is local knowledge. So, in a sense, like the only way you're going to figure out how all the fishermen fish that whole area is you have to talk to them and you have to figure out how they do it and they just do it like they do it. Because, you know, like all the pilot books, all the cruising guys say, ah, just go 50 miles offshore, avoid all that, and you, <laughs> you know, end up somewhere else. Uh, but I, I think it, the original idea was really to have like, how can we have this asset, you know, and not only a personal asset of myself, but to give this opportunity that I've been given to explore, and all you need is a boat and you don't need that expensive or fancy of a boat, you just need something that sails nicely. And uh, when I was talking back to the, you know, the charter vacations, you know, 100 bucks a night or whatever, I mean, you just, it's expensive and I just don't think it's, that much fun once you get past the drinking part of it, you know? <laughs> I mean, in the sense that like, you know, like to be able to explore, to, to be able to, you know, find different places, talk to different people, move the boat ahead, you know, understand that you have a certain amount of responsibility, but the level of responsibility with something like that is tremendously smaller than a, you know, half a million, $500,000 boat, you know? Here I would say explore, you know, if someone's gonna shoot you, give them the boat, but teach them how to sail it first, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I mean that. <laughs> nice. But but that's the story, right? Because we can always build another one. We know we have the technology, and uh, and oddly enough, like the sailing industry does not like this, right? The sailing industry really wants the house type boats. I mean, they really want the RVs. I mean, and there's a lot of money in that, you know. Like they want your hundred thousand dollars. They want your two hundred thousand dollars. They sell the stream, but. At the end of the day, from my experience, like my dream here is, as I said, you know, it's like, let's say I sail two or three days, you know, and it's not a good day for sailing. I park the boat, it doesn't cost me much to park the boat, so it's no big deal. You know, let's say I can't make it to the other island, where we're having fun here. Um, and guess what? You know, if I have to spend a hundred bucks for a shower, meaning I'm going to sleep in a hotel room and take an unlimited, you know, wash all my clothes because I have unlimited water. That's never going to happen, even in a big boat. You know, I'm still so far ahead of the money thing. So you might as well come up with a boat that's really fun to sail, that you know can carry people in comfort and safety, right? But by the time you get there, you know, it's like you have this asset, and it's like, I'm, and my goal really, I mean, there would be nothing more wonderful than this boat ten years from now, looking at a, you know, the captain's log of the whole thing, and seeing fifty different names in the whole thing, right? People who took the opportunity and said, you know what, I'll give it a try, man, you know, where's the boat at, where do you want it? It's like, well, you know, that's up to you. <laughs> but if you can get back, probably someone can get there, right? And for me, the merrier, because like, in a sense, like, my goal is like, a couple times a year, to be able to pick up somewhere, somewhere new, somewhere exciting, go sailing for a couple months, you know, and say, hi, I've never been here before, man. <laughs> so, yeah, Fred? Can I talk a little bit about transporting it on land, that's oh. one of the best features of the land. Yeah, I mean, um, one of the things, none of this can happen if you can't move the boat, like a big catamaran. So part of the design that I picked was something that we can actually take apart, put it on a trailer. So, you know, maybe the adventure is like, hey, I'm in Florida, but I really want to take it to North Carolina, but I'm going to drive it there for, you know, and put it back together. It's a trailerable boat. Um, the whole thing itself uh, weighs about uh, 15 to 1600 pounds. Uh, with everything in there, 
and then you have to be at the water line you can add another 700 pounds however you want to do that you know so be it two people and a lot of gear four people and very little gear you know uh, or skinny friends, I don't know. I mean, but, but at the end of the day, that takes it to the water line. But on the other hand, it's like you can load it quite more, and suddenly a lot of volume comes in very quickly as you load it. So it's just going to slow the boat down. I mean, we've had, you know, 15 people on it, and guess what? The boat still moves. Two kegs. Two kegs. <laughs> uh, can two people uh, take and uh, drop that mass and put it back up again? Yes. Yes. So <laughs> Absolutely. I, yeah, uh, basically, um, was late in the fall, was November, and I wanted to keep the boat in through Thanksgiving because the weather was so warm that November. But then I had a conference, that uh, the SPD conference, and I was going to be gone for two days. And lo and behold, those two days it was going to blow 45. Mm. And I was like, ah, now I want to take the boat out of the water because, like, I called uh, Skipper Bud, hey, can I just put my boat there for the weekend or for the week, for the couple days? And they said, no, we don't do that. And I was like, okay. Joe, what are you doing, man? Eight o'clock in the morning. I just went to say, well, suck it up, man, because we got a boat to take out. I literally <laughs> just went to sleep and worked all night, but that's okay. <laughs> but anyways, uh, and, uh, and now we're getting better at it. Uh, and so I think if, if the boat is on a trailer, what you're going to have to do is find someone to help you just because you physically have to get it out of the trailer. So it's about four people to move a hull. We've been able to do yeah. that. Uh, but... Uh, the advantage of this, I, I call it the, co the total cost of ownership. I think in my mind, in a sense, like I won't be paying wherever the boat is, I won't ever be paying more than a couple hundred bucks a month to have it stored. You know, so what be about it. If I break it? What's that? Nothing. Oh, <laughs> yeah, but, uh, but all boats break. I mean, you, you can expect it in, in any boat. Like the general rule of thumb for the industry is that. The maintenance cost of the boat is about 10% of the original new price. So if you're buying a million dollar boat, expect to spend 100000 a year to keep it running in top shape. And that includes replacing sails every five years, running gear, winches, you know, a winch for a big boat like that, that in itself is like almost $10,000, you know, so the, the numbers are big, you know, but most people spend about that, well, maybe cars are a little bit better, but, you know. Uh, I rarely had a car in my life that I didn't spend at least a thousand bucks a year, right, to just keep it running. Um, yeah, any other questions? Well, one thing, I'm, last weekend I went and looked at every single bridge that crossed the Wisconsin River between Sauk City and the Mississippi. Hmm. You can knock that mass down, you can make it from Sauk City all the way to Tampa, Florida. Yep. No, and, uh, and it's one of those things like, well, with this boat, you could actually, like the intercoastal is all 60 feet high, you know, so you, right. once you get to the intercoastal, you're good. Um, the Mississippi, you can also go, but you have to wait for all the, the bridges and especially the, the train bridges. Those are the really painful ones. But the Mississippi down from uh, St. Louis is really boring because it's all levees, so there's nothing to see. People take the 10 ton waterway, I think it's called, you know, go around. Uh, yeah. Um, and again, with the shallow draft, you can go to the marine and say, give me that shitty spot that no one's using, <laughs> you know? And uh, it's one of the interesting things that in all of the business, the one thing that's linear for odd reasons is a birth. In the sense that like, they say, well, it's 15, you know, a buck 50 a foot, you know? Whether, and so like between 30 and 40 feet, man, the 40 foot boat is a much, much bigger boat, but you're really not paying that much more to have a 40 foot boat because, you know, uh, but when you have a boat that you can just sneak in. Uh, the other thing I found is that uh, outside of the U.S., uh, living in a marina is a sketchy proposition. We always prefer being out in Anchorage, first because you have the breeze and the breeze takes all the bugs away, you know, almost by definition if you're in the marina you're tucked into somewhere. Um, we also found it a little bit safer as far as like, you know, you know when someone's approaching a boat rather than someone you know, uh, and less noisy, uh, but yeah, each is old. <laughs> I mean, again, one of those things, you know, maybe all you're going to do is go to one of these places and you're going to pick up the boat in the slip of the marina and all you're going to do that week, let's say in the BVI, just day sail the thing and bring it back. It's like, fine by me, you know? Doesn't <laughs> but 
when I look at the construction of it, when I think about the sloop, the ILs, you know, it's like in a sense like I put a real big beefy bow on the whole thing, you know. It's a simple sloop rig, you know, driven to main, got a spinnaker there just for fun. But at the end of the day, it's a very simple boat to sail. And it's one of those where like, because it's small, unless you're going really fast, if you hit something, nothing's gonna happen, like a sloop, you know, I mean, how many times does a sloop bang into a pier? It's like, hey, I'm gonna scratch the paint, whatever, no big deal, you know. Um, but that was the, the size of the boat that I thought would fit. In fact, I looked at a 25 footer, which is a newer design from the same guy. I said, you know what? If I can live with the 24, I'm not gonna go with the 25. And, so I, and sure enough, 24 foot it is. And because I went with 24, you know, since I was able to rescue the mass from the Ericsson 28 or the 24 that we scrapped, so the mass that goes on this boat is from a boat, hoofer boat that got damaged. Um, can we clap the batteries out? What's that? Can we clap the batteries out? Oh, no. <laughs>